Good morning. Well, I am touched by Father Shea's words that, you know, this is the Easter season, and of course today is Easter Monday. Uh, I myself, however, to be quite honest with you, I'm barely pious. I'm almost not even religious, and so I'm also painfully aware that besides being Easter Monday, it's April 1st, which is, in our culture, April Fool's Day. Um, I think you may have been promised last week that Father Albano was going to be preaching, uh, but he couldn't make it, and so he called me and asked if I could come down and do this. Um, on the way over, driving with Father Carroll, our provincial, he said, well, you're sort of like the April Fool's joke for the people today. And I said, yeah, I guess you're probably right. That's about the long and the short of it. But the topic that I was asked to say something on is this topic of the Eucharist, the Last Supper. I'm not exactly sure why the Last Supper was chosen. When you come right down to it, it's sort of Easter Monday, and it probably would have been more logical to have done this last week, considering that we celebrated Holy Thursday. But the more that I thought about it, the more I said to myself, you know, maybe it wasn't such a bad idea, lest we fall into the trap of thinking that somehow or other this thing that we call the Paschal Mystery of Jesus is simply a matter of strict chronological events. But as I was thinking about today's homily, I was wondering if I've ever actually been literally to a Last Supper. And for the life of me, as I tried to noodle with this and think about this, it seemed to me that, to my knowledge, there's only one Last Supper in my life that I can actually recall. And that was the Last Supper of my mother. I'm not going to get into all of the details, but she passed away in what we sometimes call the blizzard of 1987, the January blizzard of 1987. It was then that she died, and I had the privilege of being home at the time. I was studying at Catholic U in Washington for my doctorate, and I happened to come home the day before because I knew there was going to be a blizzard. When I arrived home, I found out that she was sick. My father said she had been sick for several days and they didn't want to tell me because they didn't want to worry. He also said she hadn't eaten for several days. So I said to her, Mom, if I go to the supermarket tomorrow and get the ingredients and try to make some fresh chicken noodle soup, will you at least try to eat it? And of course that night the blizzard began. The next morning I made my way through several feet of snow walking to the local supermarket. They lived at that point in Feasterville, Pennsylvania. Got what was left on the shelves that could kind of function as ingredients for chicken noodle soup and spent the day making this homemade chicken noodle soup. That night when it was prepared, um, she was sitting in the rocker in our living room and I brought the soup into her. She was too weak uh, to actually come to the dining room table and I literally fed her spoon by spoon until she finally motioned to me that she just couldn't eat anymore. I brought the remainder of the contents of the bowl back into the kitchen and when I did that, I heard a thump. I turned the bend from the kitchen to look into the living room and she had fallen onto the floor. And as I bent over her body, I realized that either she was dying or she was already dead. And I couldn't stand the thought of her actually dying on the floor, so I picked her up and carried her over to the couch. And I remember afterwards at the wake, and it was a bit of a raucous wake, it was sort of an Irish wake, I guess you would call it. She herself was not Irish, but much of the other family happened to be. And a number of my friends and myself, we were laughing about all of this, thinking that perhaps it was the soup that killed her. That might seem a strange thought, but you know, I, I guess when you come right down to it, laughter in the midst of sorrow is one of the ways that very often in our lives 
we try to negotiate painful experiences. We find a way around them, trying to cope with them. But later on, when I was by myself, and I was thinking about the experience, I thought about those last hours and those last moments of her life. And it seemed to me that it was one of those great graces that you have every once in a while. The thought struck me that it was the only time, I think, in my entire life that I literally carried in my arms the woman that had often carried me in her arms or into whose arms I fled when I was either afraid or in pain or hurting. And it was certainly the only time that I can possibly recall that I ever literally cooked for her and literally fed her spoon by spoon. It was, I suppose you would call it a precious moment of being able to look into the heart of naked love. We don't get these very often in life. And the truth of the matter is when we do, we can't bear to have too many of them. I suppose when you come right down to it, only the saints and the mystics can cope with those kinds of naked moments of love. But it seems to me that as I think about our Lord's Last Supper, it was what you might call one of those naked moments of love. I know you must be tired of me. I stood in this pulpit, I think, not three or four weeks ago. And I believe that one of the things I said was that if religion is anything, if it is to amount to anything, it must amount to love. I realize that in our culture, of course, love is one of those dangerous words. We highly sentimentalize it or we highly sexualize it. And so perhaps the better word is charity or even the Greek word agape, which doesn't deny or refuse either the sentimentality or even the sexuality, but rather it absorbs it and it transforms it into something deeper and something greater and something better. That this thing that we call the Eucharist and Jesus' giving of this Eucharist at the Last Supper is that kind of agape, that kind of love, that kind of pouring out a gift that is freely given to us by the Lord. You know, sometimes I tend to think that we get so wrapped up in the politically correct questions that we sometimes raise these days, you know, as to who was really at the Last Supper. Were there other people at the Last Supper? You know, you had that entire Da Vinci Code thing where one of the ideas was that perhaps Mary Magdalene was there as well. It's all very interesting. But in playing with all of those ideas, perhaps we forget or run the risk of overlooking who was at the Last Supper. And who we definitely know happened to be at the Last Supper, it was the Twelve. And when you come right down to it, my brothers and sisters, they were a ragtag, motley crowd. You have St. Peter who was perhaps the most impetuous of all of the apostles, and who not long after the Last Supper denied Jesus three times. You had Judas, who betrayed him for 30 pieces of silver. You had the so-called sons of Zebedee, who wanted to sit one on his right and one on his left hand in the kingdom that was coming. And then you had all of the others who at least on one occasion argued about who was the greatest among them. 
so much so that Jesus had to bring into the midst a little child and say to them, if you want to be great, become the least, like this child. And then you had all of them, with the exception of the women who ultimately ran at the end and abandoned him. These were not the whole and the well healed and the well washed. They were once again broken, fragile human beings. And it is to broken, fragile human beings that our Lord entrusts the Eucharist in love and in mercy. Sometimes, to be honest with you, I think we get this thing all balled up. We tend to think that it has something to do with being perfect or being righteous, and that we turn it into a reward rather than what it truly is. It is a gift that is given to us by Christ and freely given to us as we are. You know, I sort of remember when I was a kid, there was a song we used to sing very often at Holy Communion time. We don't sing it very much anymore. We don't sing it because the liturgists, and let me tell you, I am one of them. That's supposed to be my area of expertise. The liturgists tell us that it's too sentimental and that it's too individually, you know, it's too individualistic. But it was that old hymn, O oh Lord, I am not worthy. You might recall the words. O oh Lord, I am not worthy that thou should come to me. And that is the truth of the matter. We are not worthy. But in the final analysis, my brothers and sisters, it's not a question of worthiness or unworthiness. It's a question of love, of God's absolute and unconditional love for us. You know, it's rather interesting. The gospel that was proclaimed today is not what one would call a Eucharistic gospel. It's not about the Last Supper. But really, in a sense, if you look at it and you take a second glance, it is very much connected to the Eucharist. We are all like Mary Magdalene and the other Mary who go quickly to the tomb, filled, as the Gospel tells us, partly with fear and partly with joy. We come to this celebration of the Eucharist both fearful and joyful. And it is here that we encounter the risen Christ. And like them, we embrace his feet and we do him homage. And the truth of the matter is, this risen Jesus says the same thing to us that he says to the Marys in today's gospel. Do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. Jesus is with us this day and every day.